so you said that you did a yeah. spell at QPR. So I did a spell there. Um, so yeah. at 21, I kind of start to make, make the transition and realise kind of I needed to look in football, but look outside of playing as such. I was still playing. 21, so, I, won, I won the Conference South at 21. Um, so, so to so, be fair... So, so so yeah so sorry like let's just just jump into that so what so were you at an academy yes yeah, so i went the whole way through so i did two years at watford nines to 11s yeah um and then 11 got released um and then from 11 to 19 i was at wickham went the whole way through yeah. um at wickham wanderers um got released at wickham at 19 after first year pro uh signed at ebsley in the in the national um played the first 10 games had a disagreement with the manager um at 19 um and then to be fair after that i um kind of floated between the conference south conference south for, for quite a few years um and then moved on to kind of the coaching at 21 i thought you know i had a stint at southampton on trial at 21 at the end of the season um where they told me at fifth dad a 15 year old as good as me <laughs> it was six years younger which was Prowse. um so i can I can hold Which, that one. Perhaps, what? Yeah. What? Jay. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Okay. So, to be fair, look, they said at twenty-one. So Ledry took me into Southampton uh, yeah. on trial. Okay. I done really well in the Conference South. As uh, scored twelve in twenty-four. Yeah, Thought this is my enough. chance to get back into professional football. Um, had a stint at Dagenham on trial. Got off the contract. The money was, to be fair, I got offered one fifty a week for two years. Um, as a as a twenty. 21 year old I kind of made the choice that for me that's not really a career I kind of want to go down at, at give my life up for two years I remember working that working out the amount in the meeting and telling the manager I'll probably uh, more working in a local shop full-time than playing full-time at a football club um, that's like 15,000 a year isn't it no less less 150 pound a week it was 50 it was, it was 150 pound a week works out to be 600 pound a month so you're looking at 14 oh, no. and a half across two years. Oh my God, that's, that's cringe. Yeah. So look, I kind of, I sat there and said, look, for me, by the time I've taken out living and driving to Essex five days a week and slapping around the country playing, uh, look, it was a great opportunity. They'd just been promoted to League One. Um, but fundamentally, it's not something I kind of wanted to... Uh, go and give my life up for in terms of mm. financially. Um, so then I I kind of fell into coaching when I come out of the pro game. I was doing P teaching. Um, and then at 23, at the end of 23, uh, 2013, I set up obviously my company alongside my football playing career as such um, in the Conference South. So I was doing both like any non-league player playing and obviously earning a living. Um, how, how did you get your contact into QPR? So my con contact into QPR was Dean Forton, who is now the first, oh, yeah. team, first team goalkeeper coach at Southampton He's under cool, us. Um, cool guy. Yeah, yeah so like Dean, was, goal yeah. Dean was two years above me at Wickham. So right, okay. I, used to travel in, I used to travel in with him as a kid when he was obviously driving. And obviously when I was playing up in the youth team as a, as a 16, I'd obviously would be around him. Um, so I knew, knew, knew Dean well. Um, I went into Barnet because it was local for me when I kind of made the choice. I did three weeks at Barnet. One of the games at Barnet was at QPR. And then he said, why don't you come in? So I had a good conversation with uh, James Fawn, who was the academy manager at the time at Barnet. Um, I said, look, I've been presented with an opportunity to go into QPR. I know I understand I've been here three weeks, but you are League Two. They are at the, at the moment, they were pushing Premiership. I know they were Premiership at the time. They were premiership. That was the era where Matty Phillips, Alex McCarthy, they were throwing big money at in terms of QPR. They were they were in and around the Prem. Um, so I backed myself. Um, he went mad saying he's had coaches, been with him four or five years, and I've walked in and walked out in four weeks. Um, but listen, football's a game where you're presented sometimes with one opportunity, and if you don't take it, you kind of regret it. So I just thought, you know what, if it, if it comes to nothing and I don't ever work in the academy system again, I've given it my best shot and I've backed myself in terms of my ability to, to take to take the role. Um, went in and got offered the assistant assistant 15s with, with Furs at the time. So to go work with the 15s, obviously my first first real proper role was uh, was really good. Um, and then I become lead of a couple of age groups after that. Um, and then obviously ran the futsal for the club 
as well, was in charge of the futsal program. And you were playing futsal as well. Yeah, so when I come out of football, I then went into the futsal. I went and played futsal. Um, and look, for me, I'm a, I'm a big believer. I've just had my, I just finished my B license this week. UA for B on futsal. Um, I just got to send over my session plans. It it it, it changed my game personally in terms of I come from an era. I'm 34, I come from an era which is passing and moving. Get it, give it to your fastest player, let them do the work as a centre midfielder. I didn't play any other position but centre midfield. That kind of was one of my biggest regrets. Looking back on it now, at 19, the manager wanted to convert me into a right back. Um, um, because I was never receptive into moving positions and it kind of wasn't the norm. I'd only ever played centre midfield. I wasn't really accepting it. And I enjoyed it, but I'd said I'd rather be released at the end of the season and, uh, and play my position. The... Oh, sorry, just lost your sound, Scott. S Scott, we just lo lost your sound? Yeah, yeah, that now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so now I so said, look, I, um, so yeah, so I ended up, we, we weren't receptive to moving positions. You know, you ever played, you played in your strongest position throughout my whole academy career. If someone better come along it was to, it was down to me to prove myself that I'm better than them um, and you know eventually when you get into the first team and points are to be played and you know I talk about loans I went on loan it was something that uh, that in the end I decided I kind of wanted to play centre mid so that that kind of happened and I kind of fell into coaching um, had three and a half years just under four at QPR um, come out of it to set my academy up so obviously oh, but sorry so Sorry, just on the futsal side of things, because I think like you were saying how you'd played centre midfield all this time. H how has futsal helped you like, can, understand I different can, positions or develop can, you as a player? I can, I can dribble with the ball. <laughs> I can dribble with the ball. I had to teach myself how to manipulate the ball in areas where on a football pitch, playing centre midfield, I didn't ever really need to really worry about. You know, I got it. I moved it. I always played a year or two years up. You know, at 15s, I was starting and playing for the reserves at Wickham. Um, and look, I'm five foot eight. I'm tiny in terms of physique, in terms of on a football pitch, I'm still one of the smallest. So playing centre midfield, I had to learn and adapt my game quickly when I played against someone who was physically bigger and stronger than me to, to be quicker mentally than them and to move the ball faster than to not kind of get myself in a in a kind of physical physical fight. Um, Futsal really taught me how to use my body, how to protect the ball in tight areas, how to trust myself regardless of that physical side that actually I can protect and hide the ball well regardless of contact. When when on a football pitch, I was always taught to move it quickly. Um, so for me, it really changed my game, like, you know, in terms of dribbling and trusting my feet, being able to receive the ball in tight spaces. Um, so look, for me, that side of it, I was, uh, I, I, it opened my eyes. It opened my eyes in, in a, to, I'd say too late. I'm not going to say my football career could have gone anywhere else, but it taught me how to adapt and change my game in a way that I'd never been taught in a football academy environment. Wow, that's so cool to hear. I, um, I feel like I've got more questions on that. Um, and I think we're probably getting into like quite a futsal yeah. conversation, yeah. which probably deserves more extended time to focus on that. But um, yeah, that's really, really interesting to hear. And, and, then, and then just before sort of like moving on into the topic, um, yeah, I mean, could you talk a little bit about setting up your company and maybe like a bit of the ethos of your company? Yes, yeah, so I, about... I set up SFC 10 years ago, so it'd be 10 years now this, well, just March just gone. Um, the, the idea was to bridge the gap between, between academy and, and grassroots, as, as was the plan. Um, I run a football camp four weeks after opening because I've, I've been working in a number of schools. So I knew a lot of children and I knew a lot of children in the kind of academy game. So the idea of the camp was to kind of bridge the gap between a fun camp and a, a learning camp. Um, I brought in a few of the boys who worked with me at QPR to assist. And I remember one of the, one of the coaches didn't really get on that well with, with a number of kids because he was kind of trying to teach them how to play and, and was teaching them the kind of the tactical side and things like that. I remember speaking to the a parent at the end of it and, and she kind of made a valid point, which I learned four weeks into opening the company. She was like, you know, I don't care. My son's not here to become a footballer. Like, I don't want to do it. 
for, for to getting him into an academy. I just wanted him to ensure that he kind of enjoyed his day and he didn't enjoy his day. And I kind of asked why. She said, well, I think the coach was quite strict. I said, well, what coach did he like? And she kind of mentioned one of the younger coaches. And I was like, look, you're comparing in school term, a lecturer, a uni lecturer to a nursery teacher. They both have got roles and they both help, but one wants to really diverge into detail and one's there to kind of nurture and support and, and enjoy. And, and she said, yeah, it doesn't bother me what, what qualifications they have. As long, as long as my kid has fun, then, then that's all I care about. And that kind of changed my whole ethos for the, for the club. So we're, we're a club that accept anyone. I've got a number of children who just want to play fun with their friends. Uh, we've got 27 grassroots teams um, and growing. Uh, we have sessions starting from two up. So we kind of just, I've got kids who, who honestly just come for fun and bless them, they've got no technical ability, but they try hard, enjoy themselves and, and just want to have a run around for an hour. And I've got the academy kid in different sessions who, who wants to aspire to, to kind of become an academy. I know, obviously, to, uh, looking at the uh, gem page, I was talking to Zab's dad. I know you guys work with Zab as well. Um, um, it's someone who's come in about a year ago, a year and a half ago to work with me. Um, so I knew there was a crossover in terms of players for that. But look, I've got the kid who's breaking into the first team and the two-year-old who, who just wants to have fun and play football. So look, my SFC is, is, is a club that nurtures and, and supports whatever, whatever football journey and whatever learning journey they kind of want to go to. Um, is that how I set it out to be? No, no, if I'm honest. Um, but the way it's kind of changed and, and developed throughout the years, it's that you tailor it to your market in terms of from a business aspect you've got to be adaptable you've got to to accept change and sometimes you've got to be willing to to support what your market wants and and i'm in a demand in terms of that at the moment so that that can all change very very quickly but but yeah that's kind of sfc in a nutshell no i i completely agree with that ethos um it's it's a very very similar journey for myself with we make footballers because if i think back to how like i started things back in sort of 2008 like so so long ago and uh, i was volunteering at a club at old eyes worthians I yeah know, like, well you... i was at belmont as a right. kid right okay okay um so so yeah so uh, like, i think i feel like old eyes used to have like real battles with um brunswick yeah, and so, belmont you and, had, um, yeah. Nana and what's exactly the twins so that exactly. was my age group. That right. was my age group. It was us okay, and them okay. that used to have. We used to have great battles as as a kid, kind of coming so, through, coming through so, the youth. So, so I'm five years older. Um. So so like I went in at like fifteen when they were like under under twelves, and so I was like volunteering with that age group. Yeah. And um, the guy who was the manager, Mark Stowe, he was um a Chelsea scout, and like. Like I'd I'd not come from that academy. Oh, and do you mind if I just put you on mute for a sex squad? Is that all right? Cool. Yeah. So yeah, just just really quickly, just explain this. Uh, so yeah, like I was then like volunteering um, with Mark Stowe, and I'd not been in an academy environment myself. And so then, like, it was very very kind of like new to me with just seeing like players like Nana and Bashley, and then all all the other Kieran Forbes. Uh, all them like good players and very, it, it was all players that were being pushed through to Chelsea because that's what Mark Stowe, Stowe was doing yeah. with that old eyes team. Yeah. And so then th my whole world then was then going into Chelsea and everything around recruiting like top players and being under Mark, the whole thing was like, you've got to get players to Chelsea. You've got to get players signed. Um, how, yeah. How can we find the best six year old? How can we find the best seven year old? And, I was like kind of indoctrinated that very early. Yeah, and we had, so then, we had, that's what, sorry. listen, we had, at Belmont, we had, we had, out of our under eight team, seven of us got, or six of us got signed, to be fair. So, but, you know, it was unheard of at that sort of time, like that many players at clubs being, being signed. But, but I think like the ego gets involved. I think like it becomes very competitive if you're working as a scout or as a coach and you're sort of like new to it and you haven't come from academy environment before, like you, that becomes the whole goal. And, and then when you start working with good players, so like what happened by the time I got to like 21, this is around 2008, then Mark took away all the clubs away from all the eyes left it me and matt were then like getting things going with like just just doing our training and, and we were both working at chelsea and there was a year group which was almost like a 
like, I don't know, a kind of right off, I wouldn't say right off year group, but it was a first year for us. But then the year after, that's when we were caught to talk about this team. We had the Galacticos that yes. had like five players go pro. And, and that was Michael Lise was in that team. And, and anyway, like that was the everything. But then as, as time went on, I think like, as I think I matured, then I'm thinking, all right, well, sometimes you just got to keep kids in the system because where they develop later, if they keep training and keep persevering, I'm thinking like Ryan Colley, who now plays for QPR first team, he wasn't one who got signed at under nine. And there's another one, Adam Doogie as well, another one who went signed it and played with QPR. Um, he, I think he's a pro somewhere now. But these ones are just, they, they just come to the training. They're enjoying their training. They stuck with it. They didn't get signed. They weren't like super talents to start with. But because you've made the training fun and nurturing, then they've then found their path. So that changed my whole perspective because I'm just like, make sure you're putting on really great professional training for everyone. Everyone kind of gets the same stuff. And then people can then get more and more elite, the better they are. Uh, and so, yeah, so it seems that we're very, very aligned. It's, there, just, right? it's just very, unfortunately, I say, fortunately and unfortunately, it's just very different from from back in the day how how football looks in terms of grassroots, you know, with private sessions, private academies, all of that stuff. It, it's it just, it's different mm. pathways, you know. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. You used to go to tournaments and it was only grassroots teams. Mm. Like at tournaments now, you've got four or five private academies who will bring in players across a number of teams who who know players, you know. So in terms of it, it's just very different that that kind of grassroots theme. And that's why I, like, that's why I started Club SFC. So Club SFC is our Sunday league team. It's a charity. Uh, it's a registered charity. Um, and it's football for everyone, mm. you know. I always try mm. to explain to parents, whilst we might have that elite under seven and eight team, I've got four four teams. No, we've got five teams confirmed next year for under sevens that will play across from the top division to the bottom division. But there's a place for every child within the club. You know, mm. whether it's that child who's at the top and a child who's at the bottom, there's there's a place for them within within a football environment. And it's I, I, I know a lot of these kids for a long, long time. It's... I feel it's my my responsibility and and my job in terms of especially as as paying customers and and kind of the, that that aspect of respect and loyalty to you as as a club to to provide them with an opportunity to play rather than just turn the back and go actually you're not so good there you go thank you all the best go somewhere else who who are then going to show you some love I think there is a place and clubs are able to do it where there is a place for for every child in terms of whether they are at that elite academy level at sevens and eights or the child who just wants to be in a fun under 17 with their friends well i think this transitions like here in that journey and thank you for taking the time to explain all that and i think this then helps us transition into our topic for this evening which is around the idea of multi-sports yep. and, and, and the need for multi-sports at young ages to help with then ending up specialising. So you did a video a few weeks ago yep. um, that, that you, you shared with me. And um, would you mind, because maybe some of the audience haven't seen it, would you mind like just explaining, re-explaining what you were saying in that video? Yeah. So we speak about, so, so the question I got asked was how can parents support a learning journey how can parents support their child um which kind of went into just discussing how obviously we see some children i said do nine day weeks and seven day weeks where they'll do three sessions across a, a saturday go and play for two teams on a sunday play football across however many nights a week um i spoke about briefly in terms of not going to to the coach on instagram who who is perceived to be to be the coach everyone goes to because what works for one doesn't always work for all so it's finding that right coach for that for your child rather than kind of following trend and just because next door goes to me that doesn't mean it works for your son or, or it, I, my, my style might not work or, or what you're looking for there might be a better person for that you know so we spoke about that and then I went on to speak about obviously letting kids be kids and play different sports and 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 go go and try different things and, and things like that. So, yeah, I, look, it comes from a teaching background. I've, I've taught in schools for seven years. I kind of stepped away from it about five years ago just because of the amount of admin and stuff kind of through company that, that ended up taking up. So 
look, I'm, I'm a big believer in terms of in the foundation, foundation age groups, especially in the pre-academy, to be able to go and play across a number of sports. Listen, not every day of the week, but you might dip in one or two different sports. And look, again, we'll touch base on it afterwards, and I'm sure it's going to be one of the questions. I'm going to say the same about football. You could play football five days a week with a coach that doesn't offer you necessarily something that something of value, but you're playing football five days a week. And it's the same thing with, with any other sports. Like, I've just signed my daughter up for gymnastics. You know, I'm on the waiting list. She's down to go to Harrow Gymnastics Club. Why? Because I know I went there as a kid. I did gymnastics up until the age of seven. And one of my friends went through the gymnastic program there and represented Great Britain at the World Championships. It's one of the, one of the so-called best in London. Now, as a parent, I want to provide my daughter with that education. Listen, I'm not going to say she's going to become a world-class gymnastics player, but I'm giving her that education where, and the pathway that I know that that's what they're good at. That's what they're, they, they are known to do. They're known to produce, produce gymnasts. Now, for me, I've got a local gymnastics club, and this is where I've kind of had a debate with my wife. And she goes, why don't we just sign her up to local gymnastics club around the corner? And I said, but why, why would we do that? I'd rather give her the best quality. And, and if she chooses to take that pathway, that's down to her, rather than just put her in a session for the sake of putting her in a session and ticking a box. So whilst, whilst multi-sports is really important, and I am a believer that there's a lot of transferable skills across a number of sports. And, and again, I'll touch into my mum was a, a county badminton player and squash player that that's what I grew up on I grew up on a on a court with my mum that was my agility and my speed and strength session that was me playing against her from the age of seven to 18 um I also did athletics I swam I did jiu-jitsu mm. now do I think that it's helped me long term yeah I think there's a lot of transferable skills that have but I think as you then get older and you start to specialise and it starts to become a niche and you start to look to go, actually, this is what I'm, what I'm really, really good at. I think then that's a time in the older age group to really kind of hound in the aspects of certain things like football and then separate it based on as you're getting older through that development stage. Mm. Matthew, um, w w hear hearing that with what Scott said, um, do you have like sh very different views or what, what's your kind of like feeling on it? No, I mean, I going back five years, I would have been the biggest advocate of multi-sports. Uh, I played a lot of rugby when I was younger and, and yeah, I would have, and I think going back a few years, you could look at, you could look at a lot of the legitimate research and you could say a lot of elite athletes played multi-sport when they were younger. But I think football has turned itself into a specialist sport now um, because I mean, a, a friend of mine was at an under six tournament today. He said it was frightening. He said just the level of under six is now are phenomenal. So if they're that good now at five, year, five and six years old, they have to have been really only doing football for the last couple of years. Um, and then to stay that good now, you know, if, if they're once a week doing gymnastics, swimming, rugby, whatever it is, where the other ones on their team are just doing football, when it comes to getting signed at under eights, the players that are just doing football are getting more football training, and at that age, that's gonna, you know, touches of the ball are probably what's gonna count. So it, it's, I don't know where I sit now. I'm very much on the fence, and like, cause I, just, I can't, and me, me and Sean joked about it earlier. I think we're gonna have a conversation that ends up with all of us sitting on the fence because we're gonna go back and forth about the benefits of it. But yeah, now is it a case of, you know, I think a lot of, yeah, a lot of the past kind of research as such was, was based on our generation. I was reading an article about Phil Foden the other day. From what it sounds like, he didn't explicitly say it, but he just said he played football every day of his life. So the, the young pros now, the Phil Fodens, the Jude Bellings, and, and, and they're the kind of the, the ones that are under 23s coming through, um, it would be really interesting to know their journey because I'm going to hazard a guess and say that new generation of talent coming through probably isn't as multi-sport as what our generation was. I need to interrupt the podcast one more time. Did you know that We Make Footballers is a franchise business? We began franchising in 2015 and we now have over 60 franchises in operation across the UK, Dubai and US serving over 10,000 players. If you're a talented coach but don't want to start your own coaching business alone, visit franchisewmf.com 
to find out how we make footballers can help you operate a successful football coaching company. I just think there's a specific, sorry, Sean, I just think there's a specific element to it, you know, like in terms of athletics. Like my, my, my biggest strength was I was able to run. I was a runner playing centre mid. I could run for 90 minutes. My endurance was really, really good. I was just blessed with that talent. Like I didn't work on it. I then went to athletics because my start to, uh, to sprint wasn't, wasn't good enough. You know, I had to go and work at that to get better at that, that stop to start kind of couple of yards in terms of what's needed in football. And I remember going to athletics. I hated it. Like, I'm honest, I hated it. I used to have like a 40 metre head start. And I've got boys 40 metres behind me beating me by 20 metres. But it helped, it helped my football career because I know that if I wouldn't have got to that, to that, to that, got it to a good enough level, I would have been released. I would have, I would have been let go based on my, my movement wasn't good enough. The, the only thing with what you're describing there, Scott, is you, that sounds like training that is done to help you with your football specifically yeah. like it's, it's not like you're saying I'm no sorry, of course I'm but then I'm, I'm gonna go fencing. I'm gonna go into the badminton and squash side so from the age of seven to 18 I played against my mum on the court or especially badminton I didn't beat her till I was 16 because I didn't beat her once till I was 16 can, but that but but sorry sorry can I just interrupt do you think that you became the very best footballer that you could possibly have been I believe in terms of it I believe my generation we didn't have we didn't have what's available now. So in terms of my parents had no football knowledge at all, they got me to a level where, where I was able to sign pro. Like, I think, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to say I should have had a better career because I'm not here to sit here and talk about that. But I believe I got to my level. I do believe right. that. I, I do believe I got to my level. If my, my, my regret was not playing right back, the way the game looks at a right back now compared to how tall people are in centre mid. I would have I would have had a longer career playing right back because I can run, I can pass, I can attack, I can tackle. Yeah. Then, then I would do I would do playing centre mid that, that I used to get moved out when there was a six foot four player playing up against me. So I, I suppose that, that. Cool. So I just suppose that I'm just but while you're just talking about badminton, like I'm I'm going back to say, would any of this program would you have changed it? Would you have kept the badminton in in part of your development journey? Yeah. Listen. I, like, again, I've got a four-year-old. I don't, I don't plan. I, I hope, listen, it's down to him. I don't plan to, to do the professional game with him. If that's what he chooses, like, it's not me pushing it. If that's what he chooses to do, then I will support him and I will back him till, for what, till, till he gets to where he wants to get to. But it's not me being a, a driving aspect from it. I'd, I've got him on his scooter every day. The, him, him, and my do- like him and my daughter... They're three and four. They'll do half a mile to a mile every morning with me on their scooter every day. Like training breeds habits in terms of that. I, I, like they both swim once or twice a week. You know, he will play football once or twice a week. You know, do I think playing football four times a week we're getting better? No, of course that. But at the moment, I'm still of the opinion. And again, I'd rather give him a more all-rounded approach in terms of understanding how to move how to move because I don't believe at times football sessions do that we get them to dribble but as again I'm going to go back to badminton my mum moved me around the court for nine years she used to give it she used to give me 18 point head start and beat me 21 18 she had me stepping forward stepping back back pedaling jumping off back pedaling you know all of the aspects that actually look at transferable skills for football about defending getting low moving your feet fast pushing off for me, so, so- for me that, that taught me that taught me so much so nine. Yeah. The, the, oh, go on. I was going to say that no. isn't there a case? And then again, just like I, I, I'm sitting on the fence, and like I say before, uh, you know, a few years ago I would have been 100 percent multi-sport, but now isn't there a case of like right? You look at the skills that you learned from badminton, basketball, full of agility. Yeah. Isn't it a case of now saying okay, well as a as a football coach and taking players through like a football program to make them the best football players they can be. You're doing a session that's 90 minutes, and a lot of that session is incorporating all of that stuff. Uh, you, you can kind of oh, listen, of uh, course, then but then, but then still look at end the session with the football coach. as well. So well, you can have a 90 minute session, and 40, 45 minutes is, is movement work, and then 40, 45 minutes is, is football based. So rather than taking a 
child who played badminton or basketball, whatever it is, it's not, we're still going to take them football, but the football session is just, yeah, there's more agility work done in this but, session. Then, but then I'm, I, I, I'd go back to saying, I, I, don't, I will never preach what I'm not good at. And whilst I understand football specific movements and that there's, 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 I work with, with someone called Darren Stern, who's at Millwall, who does, who does all of that stuff for the academy, he's, he's sports and strength and conditioning and all that stuff. When, when we partner up with, 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 with players and we do that often in the summer for the older, for the older boys who are stepping into the pro game, he will work on that aspect. He will work. So I, we will have them for 90 minutes. I will deal with the football side and he will take care of that. And, and this is my point in it. Like, whilst I could put out different agility drills, there's going to be someone who's more knowledgeable and better at that than me. So my point is, is whilst, yes, it is important in a football environment to add it, it goes back to what you're paying for. Now, if you give me a child on how to sprint, I'd, 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 I'd openly say, give them to a running coach. Give them to a running coach. That's what they, that's what they are experts in. So it then goes back down to what you, what what environment then are we talking? We're talking about the coaching then, rather than because there's often people who will do this in their session, but they're not experts at it. I I, I think from like hearing you, and I've got a question for you about the badminton. During that nine years, how much a week were you playing badminton? I'd say at least once a week with my mum. Okay. Every week okay. I'll be on okay. the court. I mean, w once a week of badminton complementing football I think that I mean you'd, you'd imagine some of the first team players you could imagine like on a recovery day they're gonna go they might have trained in the morning and they might go and play badminton or something like themselves like that seems like it can work within the program it's not going to hinder and it's not going to be wasted time and right. I think it's interesting as we're talking I'm thinking about which sports complement football so I know like me and Marcelo have had conversation around the players who we felt have had, have been really like on their heels in the, their stance. And it's actually the, the amount of tennis that they were playing caused them to, uh, it, it impacted their physical movement in a negative way. Cause I feel like they were on the baseline leaning on their heels and then they were bringing that into their well, running. We, so, so we spoke I spoke about this. We spoke about this that night about tennis. And I told you about the center midfielder at, at Watford who I, oh, yeah. who I deal with. And, and again, it goes down to coaching. If if I'm standing, if I'm take if I take my son to a tennis court, I'm useless at tennis. Like I'm not going to pre, I'm rubbish at it. And, and me and him are rallying with each other. I'm not going to be able to correct his technique in terms of ten as long as he rallies the ball back to me. I'm not going to teach him. I'm not teaching him good habits. So in terms of that, that then comes back down to the coaching. So my yeah, point. No, yeah, but but I'm sorry. Just on this point though, like the tennis coach is doing a great job. The tennis coach is teaching the kid to be on their heels, lean back, strike those forearms, whatever it is, but, but then the kid is going into the car, the mum isn't saying, right, well done for all what you've learned in there with your tennis, but remember, when you go to football, make sure you're leaning forward and make sure you're moving where you're not on your heels. That conversation probably is not happening, and it's all just coming unconscious, and the child can't separate it as they move into the different sports. But so I, I'm just kind of thinking about things like, Matthew, like you're a top pool player, I think, Growing up, you played a lot of pool, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> God, where, where are you going with this? Oh, well, what I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I know, I know, like, um, like Jamie Redknapp. Jamie Redknapp um, is like wicked at ping pong, and he's also like very good at snooker. And like, that, the, there's a lot of like footballers who are good at these other sports, golf as well. And I feel like, let, let's say, like snooker, pool, golf, that seems to be sort of like, I don't identifying a ball, the timing of a swing, um, the angles of, of, of striking a ball. I feel like there's crossovers with, with some of those. And do, spending time on those sports, you're not getting physically tired. Um, it's more sort of mental and it might help with some of your striking. I think the, like, maybe a, a, the thing to really sort of uh, um, define is what is multi-sport. Because, yeah, playing a sport, whether it's badminton or whether it's different sports every week, but doing a different sport once a week, maybe, I don't know if that, that would qualify as like a multi-sport, but it's when um, you're doing a sport maybe two or three times a week, or you're doing two sports two or three times a week. So, Scott, if you used to turn around and say, yeah, no, I was competitive in badminton and I was training three times a week, I was playing football three times a week, like, 
then yeah, I had a range of different badminton. sports. Sorry? That, that, that I had a range of different sports that accompanied my football. Because I, I can look back now and go, I played so much rugby, so much rugby when I was younger. There were times when I was playing more, more rugby than football. If I had spent that time playing football, 100% I'd, I'd be better. So, yeah, I, I learned a lot from it and it gave me a lot of different, it improved me in a lot of different areas. But... Because I'm thinking, um, Scott, as you were talking and you were saying about your mum putting you into badminton and before you'd said it was only once a week, I was thinking, oh, she was getting you playing like three times a week because it was maybe like her passion. It was a, a way for her to spend time with you and it worked in the routine because she was playing and she would bring you. I was re relating it. Oh, Oh yeah, no, listen, sorry, I, sorry, I just had plays, an interesting plays, question me. pop into my head before I forget it. So yes, yeah, Scott, in your situation, you've got you say you've got a, a son. Yeah, I've got a boy and a girl. How old's your he, son? He's four. He'll be five in June. Yeah, sorry, I, I thought uh, that's wanted to make sure I got it correct. So um, he's he's loving football. Um, he shows the natural affinity to it, and he's 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 shown a bit of natural talent. He starts coaching in it. Um, or well, starts training in it a little bit more seriously. At any point, you get him to do other sports that maybe he doesn't particularly enjoy um, to try and help his, his physical capacity and just to try and help with his football, or if he's just loving football and you as a coach can kind of recognize how to make sure he's still getting doses of what he needs in, are you going to keep it football or are you still going to try and no, get him? I'd still, I'd still, I'd still honestly, I'd keep it the other way, you know, like. So next, uh, so I have a child who's who's at West Ham. I won't say ages. His 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 dad was a triathlete. His mum played seven South Africa rugby. His uncle went to the Olympics as well. So it's a sporting, it's a proper sporting family. They have him swimming three times a week. They have him doing his bike. He's also at an academy. He's a signed academy boy. Now his in level of endurance compared to others is obviously a lot higher because based on how many times a week he's training, but. They're given that for them, football's not, not the build and end all. He's just happened to be really blessed at it. And he's had to actually work really hard technically at getting better because of how natural he is at all his other sports. Now, for me, as, as a parent, I'd look at, look at adding in different things to, to, help, to help his, if that's what he wants to go and do, to help, help his football. You know, that whether it be athletics, and, and we spoke about tennis, Sean, and I spoke about to, to, to the boy who's academically clever as well, reading the line of the shot, making sure he's then, as the ball comes across court, he's, he's assessing the speed of it, what line of it, where his partner's standing. And look, I'm no tennis expert, and, and I explained it to him in that way. And I said, as a centre midfielder, as the ball comes in, when you're, on the, when you're on the baseline of a tennis court, you already know where you're hitting it. You're one step ahead. You're assessing his foot pattern as he, where he's stepping, in where to expose him on what part of the court to be able to potentially play your shot after that, you know, as he's returning it. So in terms of that point, I think there's, 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 there's general transfers across all sports that can, can help develop, to help develop mentally as well, not just physically, but yeah, I would. I would, I'd look at incorporating other sports to, to give him a more all-rounded approach because, listen, as Sean said, the late developer that comes in that comes in in the game later to an academy sometimes will have more of a tactical understanding because they're being taught how to play the game necessarily in the academy child so in terms of my son's development i would look at giving him his football if that's what he wants to go and do three times a week or whatever it is but then look to add in other other aspects to help benefit him in in that environment if mm. if he was to go if he was to go and do that so is there I, any Minimum, you make sure he plays football. Listen, I'm not, not saying you, you go multi-sport, 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 but I think there's a place where you add in aspects and elements throughout the week, which, listen, as Sean said, like, I'd add, I'd add in a badminton session with my mum and play for two hours. That didn't, that didn't hinder my football. That didn't, like, whilst, yes, I could have had a two-hour session outside, that, didn't, that, that for me didn't hinder anywhere where I got to in my football level. So I think it's about, I guess, utilising time and ensuring that, that actually you can make it fun. Like, my, my winning mentality come from losing to her on the court for seven years. Like, I was desperate to beat her. Like, you know, I was, I was always seeking her approval, you know. So whilst it was I was playing with mum and it was fun, 
touch. She was giving me, for me, the, the fundamentals that, listen, they didn't have it in the football world. Neither of my parents, bless my dad, he couldn't kick a football. Couldn't kick a football. Let, like, the only football he did was watch West Ham. So for me, that was my, my understanding in terms of mental, like keep going, that resilience of keeping going. Like I couldn't tell you how many times I lost every week. Like every week I'd lose. It took me, as I said, till I was 16 to beat her. Now that mental resilience to get back on the court, go again. She used to go, all right, Scott, I'll give you 18 nil head start. And in my head, I honestly believed I could beat her thinking I only need three points. And then she wiped the floor with me. And then she go game again. And I go, yeah, all right, go on then. She go 18 or 19. You know, so it was, this, it was, it was me playing with mum. And, but it was also a massive learn, like for me, that she got to county, county at that level. And she understood the game and look at her, Personally, it gave me, gave me, I believe, an all, a more, a better chance in football. If I wouldn't have done that, I honestly don't believe I would have gone as far as I did um, through natural talent. I did the bare minimum as a player, you know, but that outside of the stuff that, that I pushed and, and they pushed for me to do, I do believe it gave me that little edge in the era that we come from. Just the... So, 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 oh, sorry, what's, what's your question, yeah. Matt? Sorry. No, no, I was, I was going. Yeah, so. I just wanted to like bring it back to what I was kind of just talking about before with, about like the experience that I had with like my mum and and like where she, like t t in comparison to your mum putting you into badminton like my mum's passion like she she done like she was a drama teacher yeah. and she was into like ac acting so then from the age of like eight I think I was like taken to like her drama club and so I was doing like, acting like two times a week and then later on, and then I was doing tennis once a week. Um, and then my, my, my parents brought me to this like local club um, where I think I made, might play football like twice a week there, but I was all playing just park football. So as I got to a teenager, my decision making was always like so bad. Um, it was only till like I got 16 and started to play for like semi proteins where I felt like I started to get coached properly. But I look back at it and I was so pissed off at my mum for taking me to the drama club. Yeah, and I, I'm wasting money on the tennis lessons. And I was just, I say to her, like I, I say it in a bantery way, but I'm like, why did you do that? Like I could have, I could have been a good footballer and, and yeah, wasted time in the drama. And maybe, maybe like now, um, sometimes if I'm, if, if like we're doing this podcasting thing, maybe the drama stuff like might have helped me with that. Um, and, and maybe it has helped me in the long term, but yeah. For me, um, if, if, if I'm going in on a sport, like my m mindset is going to be go all in on that sport. And if I'm doing multi sports, I'm doing it with the mindset that, all right, we're going to go boxing lesson, but we're going to go boxing because it's going to help you be more aggressive. Correct. Because, but, that was, but that was always sorry. my, but that was always, that, that was always my thing. Those, my, all of my other things that I did uh, accompanied my football. It helped me in football. You know, it, th those, it transferred into my game you know, in terms of that, and that's, and that's kind of where I, that's why it's more for the younger ages, you know, just, it doesn't have to be, I'm, listen, I'm not talking changing your whole program to be a multi-sports program, but I do believe that there is a space to be able to go and do different sports within your program that will help, help push, push your program on the side as well and give you something slightly different. Can I, can I play, you know, that video that's like with the really extreme guy, um, I, I'm just going to play this. Hopefully we can get the sound and we can get the video of it. Oh, it's not got the sound. One second. Let's try again. By the way, Scott, I, I love your, uh, your mum not letting you win. I'm all about that. Parents, do not let your kids win. No, yeah, I mean, I agree. Then it taught, it, listen, I'm so competitive with them, to be fair, with my two. Everything's yeah. a competition. Everything. Whether it's walking up the stairs, they're, they're both chasing, so nice. they stand at the top so and then I win. As an elite eight-year-old, a high-performance ten-year-old, or a professional eleven-year-old, it doesn't happen. It just does. It's it's not in my vocabulary. Please get it out of yours. My job from 1992 to the 2000 Olympics was to go around Australia and try and find and identify talented athletes, pull them into a high-performance program, and help to get the best out of them the 2000 Olympics. And in spite of that, and trained as a physiologist, I can't tell you what your eight-year-old's going to do. I have no idea. I can't even tell you what sport they're going to end up in. This year's basketball player is next year's footballer. 
He's next year's butterfly swimmer. He's next year's... We don't know. We don't know. But I promise you, specialising them too early is a road to doom. It's a road so to doom. Say that to Serena Williams. And like it's that's what I mean. It's so again, like to clarify, I, I'm 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 sitting on the fence. I, I don't like a few years ago, I would have been 100 percent multi sport. But then, yeah, you look at the stories of Serena Williams and, and people like that, and Tiger Woods. Like their parents had a plan from them since before they were born. But then, but then that's but then for me, that's an individual sport. So if you're talking an yeah. individual sport here, where you can go, do you know what? You're going to tailor in tennis. Mm -hmm. You are, you only need to back yourself. Golf, you only need to back yourself. So like darts, you look at obviously that, uh, Luke, who's just flying as a, as, a, as a teenager coming through, right? That's all he's ever done, you know? But that, in, in a football environment, there's so many different aspects outside of being the individual within that team environment. Yeah, that as, whilst it is individual, you could be the best dribbler in the world. But if your, ta if your team can't give you the ball, it don't matter. Hmm. And, and, and like with that one, so I've got to send that video probably by like, like 50 to 100 times uh, through the Project Footballer channel because everyone probably thinks that that goes against a lot of the messaging that comes from Project Footballer. But anecdotally, like in my experience, I'm seeing kids from six years old go all the way through uh, and, like, and they specialise. So... Like, I mean, I, I was doing a talk the other day at Spotify with some like young kids. And then I said to them in the room, I was, I said to them, who, tell me your favorite footballers, just shout them out, favorite English footballers. And they would say Phil Foden. So I was like, oh yeah, he joined Man City when he was six. Marcus Rashford. Yep. Joined Man United when he was seven. Next one, Kyle Walker. I think Kyle Walker was at Sheffield United from a young age. The, like, I uh, repeat that sort of example. Listen, you, look at, you look at some of the squads, some of the squads, a lot of them are all pre-academy. Like you talk about like when people look at England 18s, 23s, even first, a lot of them are pre-academy. Uh, but, but then the pre-academy side of it and the sports that, that, you know, you look at, you look at a number of professional clubs and, and they're adding, they are adding that, that, that S and C, that strength and conditioning base. And it is different games. So for that, for that tailored program, I'm not going to name a club. I was on the course. They have a 30, there's a 30 minute block where they've tested and they have a specific program for their lowest five in terms of scoring to go and help their, their sprint get better. So for 30 mm. minutes, wins. So I, they, well, they are, clubs are bringing that in. I'm not talking bringing in racket sports and things like that, but that, that, that movement aspect, that agility aspect, in the S and C stuff, it's not football based. That's and, and, and so true. And professional clubs are are doing that often. That's a, that's what so I was true. trying to get at earlier. Yeah. Whereas instead of going to play basketball for ninety minutes, you can have a ninety minute session that is S and C based, speed and agility based, whatever you want to call it, movement based. But then there's you you can still kind of tag in football you can plug in football into that as well so you're still getting touches of the ball and football specific but, but stuff amongst giving them to specialists but that's my yeah. point yeah, yeah. That yeah is clubs are specialists so one of my well, yeah one of my pet peeves is is football coaches who i've got a, a very comprehensive background in snc i don't like, yeah i won't bore you with why but uh, for a football coach i would put myself up there in terms of snc knowledge because of, of, of my pack my um but that's my why you'd, i'd never but, use a ladder a hurdle and things like that, because for me, that's not my strength. So why would I preach and talk about something that's not my strength? Because I'd, I'd give them to, to, to you or, or to other people who I know who are within the game, who are, who are top, that, that we trust them. I trust them with their knowledge. So, so do, you, do you see a world where um, the academy, thinking specifically about academies, because they currently train three times a week and, and, and play on that fourth time, they up their program to five, maybe even six days a week, and they are just stealing the best pieces from other sports, you know, badminton's movement and stuff like that, but making it as kind of football specific as they can by yeah, well, putting in football drills into badminton agility drills. Yeah, I, I do think that, Matthew, um, because like here, going with the example of kind of what Scott was saying before, like I know that I've heard from Chelsea that they were looking with their movement program they built in. I remember like the presentation that come through 
and they were saying that they feel that in recent years, PE in primary schools is just out the window. I mean, there might be some like great primary schools out there. I don't want to like tarnish everyone with the same brush, but on the whole, in general, the, the level of PE is nowhere near what it You're used to be 20 years ago. 100% like, and that's seeing it in schools. Yeah. Seeing it in schools. It, it's, it's, it's gone like commercial, like the, the, the way that the schools are doing it because they're all these like businesses that have no resources. So like what they end up doing is then farming out to a big, like multi-sports company where they're using the cheapest, cheapest stuff. And I've even heard that it's, it's at a level where the, the people that they bring in, and sorry, I'm not saying this is everyone, but I've just heard some of the big, big, big companies that manage a lot of schools are taking over the PE lessons and they have these individuals who like might be part-time delivery drivers and they're trying to scratch a living and they're working on a really, really low living wage and they go into these schools and like in the morning, they have to stand on a hill and they have to like look, monitor in the playground. That's part of their job. Then they go in and they deal with the milk trays and then they go out and then they support in a PE lesson. And, and, and they've got like very, very low qualifications. They're low skilled people. And, 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 and I heard the same person went and had a nap at lunchtime and then came back. And, and you're just like, how are these people who, who are in charge of the physical development of our children, our people? Like it's nuts, but, but Chelsea have identified these kind of problems and what's going on in primary schools. So they've said, all right, well, we're losing out what used to be looked after by schools in terms of physical development, not happening anymore. So we're going to create our own and they've got them climbing ropes. They've got them jumping on the, the, the balance uh, beams. They've got them roly polying loads and loads of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Is it not called roly polying? <laughs> <laughs> the good old roly poly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they get them and they do the handstands, and, and there's all this sort of like physical development that's so important for footballers falling down, jumping back up. And, and it might look odd. It might, parents might say, oh, shouldn't they be spending that time football? No, like they need that. They, but that's, that's, my, that's but that what goes yeah, back to, yeah. but that goes back to my point. I was, I was at gymnastics, I run, I, I play badminton with my mom, but also did three days a week. Now, as I got older, and I was actually like one of the comments just come up saying as a development, as a child develops and gets old, it becomes harder, which, which I completely agree with. Cause then eventually it gets to 12, 13, 14 with, with secondary school and, and exams and things like that. And, and actually you have to then start to specialize. You have to then mm. start to specialize because actually suddenly then you're going into that development, which is why, which is why before I come on, I was looking at and thinking about actually, if you look at the reasons why we call it foundation, it's to give them a foundation. It is that across those age groups. Pre-academy is obviously pre-academy just for the sake, but in terms of the foundation, nines to 11s, that is to give them the core foundations. When you go into that development stage, that next stage, it's to develop. It's to develop mm. to, for higher, mm -hmm, to, to, mm -hmm. to get them prepared mm. to play 16s, 18s, 21s, first team. Mm. So mm. it's our job to develop and it's also our job to give them a core foundation. Now, if we're not giving them a foundation, listen, whether that's within the club, or, or outside of the club, whether it's parents or club led, it's, yeah. it's eventually going to do them a, eventually comes a point in the development phase where, where they will then potentially, and it's a potential, where natural talent sometimes will only get as far as the person who then works as hard. Mm. You know, there is, mm -hmm. there is that, that, that also counter argument. I, I think because we, we are strict with these episodes in keeping them to an hour, so we're starting to run out of time. So if I'm like kind of like concluding my thoughts from everything that I've heard uh, from, from this conversation tonight, I, I'm kind of thinking for parents who've got young children and if they want to be quite deliberate about saying that they want their children to be footballers and people have the right to do that. Like I, d I don't like other parents shaming parents and saying, oh, it's wrong that they are trying to make their kid a footballer. Well, there's loads of like famous sports stars where their parents were deliberate about the direction for their kids. Well, that's their choice. And so anyway, so let's say that a parent has that, wants to make that choice and wants to specialize in football from a young age. I think the lessons that they should pick up from this episode are that the specialization still can incorporate supplementary sports, which will aid the child's 
football development if that is their chosen sport and you could do the same thing with all the other sports the other sports you might say oh we'll go and let them play football i think the other side of it might be where a parent is saying look i i I don't want my kids to be a footballer. We are not trying to chase that route. I, I'm actually going to steer them away from professional football. So then we, it's much more about the social side of things. And we're consciously going to go and spread the week program out. And it's going to be a load of different sports through the week. And, um, and, and that is what it is. And, and maybe they'll find their way and maybe they'll find their way to professional football or whatever it is. But I feel that... Um, yeah pe people can be quite people should seek the information and and then try and like create a plan for but listen it. every but child yeah. is different every child is gonna every child's program is gonna look differently which which goes back to my first video that that what works for one does not always work for the other one child might need more of something else mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one child might need more in football one child mm. might naturally be really good so you don't have to focus whilst you're improving their strength you might focus on something that they need to then get better at to, in, to, to enhance their football. So every program and every parent, and that goes down to how the first question I got asked, how can a parent help, help their child on their journey? Your child is different to every other child you see on social media. It's your child. You know your child. You know what they're good at, what they're not good at. So incorporate things within their program. And also create your, your team around your children and, and go and do your research on who you're sending to and things like that. Don't just go to the person because that's who people go to. You know, everyone will specialize in something and everyone will be really good at something, you mm. know. So find the people who specialize within your program to help your child at, the, at, that, at each individual aspect. So you mm. might have a dribbling coach, you might have a receiving coach. Now, it all might look different, but that might be what, what, you, what your child needs. I love it. But he, um, no. yeah, and on that, the, because I, I've, I will get requested to do one-to-ones with players. And then when I ask the mum or dad, why, what are you looking to get out of this? And they shrug their shoulders and they're not sure. And it's because of that fear of keeping up with the Joneses. And then I say to them, so what I specifically do at Jen, just briefly, we work on, we we call it the fundamental skills, your ability to scan, receive, pass and change direction. That's what we do here. So I say to them, well, until you figure out exactly why you're asking me to do a one-to-one, -one, if you've got the time, Jen will always help. Like improving your ability to scan, receive and pass will always help. And then once you've figured out what you're wanting to get out of those one-to-ones, let's have another discussion. And then, you know, two weeks later, you see them doing a one-to-one -one with a, a coach I, and the same way. I got asked by a three-year-old three -year parent yesterday because I had a session with a boy who was at Arsenal and a parent watched it. So that my, my SFC kids are walking in and she pulls me and she said, I want you to do a session, Scott, with my three-year-old. And I said, but for what? She said, oh, he doesn't really concentrate that well within the class. I said, well, for what it costs in a one-to-one, -one, go and put that money into more group sessions because that's the part that you're actually wanting him to get better at. Mm -hmm. So, but, but listen. And there's, there's people, it's a completely different subject. There's people who will just take the session for the sake of the session, right? Mm. Yeah. And tell the parent what mm. they want to hear, but that's a completely different topic. And it's, mm. yeah, I think it'll start to get onto a different topic, but it, it just feels like it's the, the fear of not, you know, people are just, we have to be signed by under nines. To be signed by under nines, we just have to be doing football. We have to make sure we're doing everything else that everyone else is doing so we don't miss out. And you're exactly right. It's like doing a session with one or one coach on a specific skill might be beneficial for that player it doesn't mean that the parent of another child needs to go and do that same session with that same one-to-one -one coach it's yeah it's hard. It, it, it's, it's, it's hard though because if you're like my mum back in the day like not knowing what to do like what it has no football knowledge you are kind of like being led a little bit of what you see on social media so it is it is hard for the parents but i do agree yeah. i do agree but before everyone goes on holiday before everyone goes on holiday and you go they to a new hotel, what, what do you do? Yeah, Correct. Yeah. Before you yeah, go and yeah. spend all that money, you go and do your research. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of people that... who go to a lot of people. It's so true. listen, I, I know before I send my children to anyone, I'm making a lot of phone calls. If it's an individual where I'm going to then get them to work with my children so that I know mm. everything what they're good at. But that just comes down to, comes down to 
the level of detail that you want, right? If you're just happy to just send because it looks good because that person goes to the next door, then 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 sometimes that that coach isn't for them. That's it. That's it. And I think you know that's what we found with this project footballer platform is that we there, there probably isn't a lot of this sort of advice that's been accessible for people and that available and so yeah if people do actually like really they want their kids to be footballers and they want to understand what goes on in academy football and so on then then yeah then like yeah keep doing your research like you know like keep following these podcasts keep following the the clips that we put out on instagram and then and then you know other people like yourself and and yeah like the good people that you you sort of start finding in the network just keep researching it yeah i completely agree scott well um no, th thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really, really appreciate listening to you. No, it's been so helpful. And the well, definitive answer to parents that ask, should we do sort of multi sports? Is it depends. Uh, is, is that what we're uh, going with? It depends. Um, uh, I'm going with. I'm going with. Each child will have their own journey. <laughs> and uh, each, depends. Child, each child, and and there is a place to add it in. But there's also a place where where you need to obviously go and work with football as well. But there there, there are times and available if, if, available times. If I, if, if, if if in one minute I could try and uh, for for a six year old, if I had a six year old kid that I was trying to develop, and yeah, I agree though because it's so hard to say. If you if if the kid was like not aggressive enough, then I'm saying all right, we're going boxing and karate like three times a week until you you start getting more competitive. And and then and then if they're too aggressive, then maybe they're gonna go to a like a yoga club because they need to calm the hell down. And I don't know. So so yeah. So you're right. It does depend. But um yeah, I'm sure like yeah the other clubs and things can help with that football. All right. Well, um, Scott, would you would you would you come back and would you be with us again? Are you up for it? Always. Yeah. Nice always. Nice. Nice WhatsApp group he's gonna add you to. Oh, <laughs> cool. Uh, all right. Nice one. Cheers. See you guys. Thank you. Bye.